Good afternoon from sunny but extremely cold Copenhagen. My name is Gülçin Karadeniz and I'll be facilitating this online debate on renewable energy. I have the pleasure of being joined by two of my colleagues, Javier Esparago and uh, Mihai Tomescu, who will be talking with me and with you on renewable energies. As we are trying to heat our homes, cook our food, we use energy, and uh, today we will be focusing on renewable energy. Maybe um, I'll invite my guests, Mihai and Javier, to say a few words about what they do at the agency. Mihai, please. Thank you for having me here today, Gülçin. I work on climate and energy within the climate and energy and transport mitigation program of the agency. And because so much of the, the way we produce and consume energy is related to our uh, greenhouse gas emissions problem, my work is very closely related to climate mitigation. But nevertheless, uh, in uh, touching on energy, I, I work with other dimensions, other environmental dimensions as well, as well as with social and uh, economic aspects. And we'll touch many of those, I think, I hope, during our chat. So Javier, what do you work on? Uh, thank you, Gulzin. So I work in the same team as, uh, as Mihai on the uh, climate, energy and transport team. And I work on uh, particularly on energy assessments and uh, indicators, and as well on other parts more uh, more related to, to like the core climate change. Is... You mentioned assessments and indicators. What what do they serve for our audience who are not regular followers of our knowledge? What is an indicator, for example? What do we do with indicators? Okay. So we start with indicators. There we we take a metric that we think that it is representative of uh, of uh, of a certain dimension in reality be it um, uh, energy consumption or, or, or uh, share of renewable energy or many others that we also do with uh, greenhouse gas data. And this is, uh, is expected to, to show uh, some, some trend in, uh, in society, basically, and in the, in, the, in the fight against climate change. Of course, yeah. renewable energy and climate change, as you mentioned, Mihai, have very strong links as well. Before we actually get to the debate, I'll ask all our live viewers to uh, submit their questions in the Facebook comment section, and uh, we will be forwarding them to our colleagues. So just shoot any question that you might have about Europe's renewable energy target policies, where we are, how far we are from achieving our ambitious policies and what these policies are, just please share them with us. So having said that, um, we talk about renewable energy. Maybe we just start about what is renewable energy? Is every energy source renewable? Of course not, but what is? What constitutes renewable energy? Okay, I'll take that one. Um, well, the, I, I like other other terms that are a bit more and more vague, like, uh, like, like climate-friendly energy or low carbon energy, et cetera. A renewable is very it's relatively well defined. So it's uh, it's basically uh, energy that, that comes from from uh, natural sources, and that replenishes at the faster rate that they are consumed. So in 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 simple terms, it's energy that doesn't run out in a human lifespan. Okay. So, what are the objectives of you know in Europe of having renewable energy? Uh, what are the policy goals? Maybe, Mihai, you could take that. We have several sets of targets for the European Union and for the member states, and actually they are going quite far back. So for the time being, we're looking at 2020, but 2020 was already yesterday. And on the energy side, we had the objective to increase the share of renewable energy consumption to 20% of the final energy use and uh, to have a share of 10% renewable energy in the transport sector. For energy efficiency, the share was the the objective, the target was to improve uh, the efficiency of the union by 20% by 2020 as well. Okay. You, you started actually saying that there are different energies and you know, this renewables are supposed to get a greater share of, of uh, Europe's energy consumption. I'll ask a question. Can we ever foresee a future where renewables meet all our energy needs? Uh, well, I, I hope so. <laughs> If we are to become a, a continent, uh, uh, if we're going to become climate neutral continent, uh, we, we need to source um, all or at least most of our uh, energy needs uh, from, from, from renewables, together with another low carbon technologies as well. However, this is, uh, this is not going to be easy. This will be very challenging. And we'll talk a little bit about how to get there as well. 
be challenging for sure. But what is, what is be... the current state at the moment? So how much of it do we uh, get from renewables? Well, when it comes to electricity, uh, we're sourcing nearly like a third of, uh, of electricity from renewables. Uh, this was the latest official statistics in 2019. Uh, when it comes to the global, the total energy, then there was still uh, a bit far. Then the still oil and, and gas are, are the main energy sources. Okay. And can you give some idea of like, um, can you see changes in these trends over say the last decade? Oh, absolutely. Uh, renewable energy, the deployment of renewable energy over the last uh, the two decades have been, have been impressive. Since 2004, it has uh, more than doubled the share of, uh, of renewable energy. And particularly on the electricity sector, now it uh, it covers uh, covers like thirty four percent of the of the generation yeah. Yeah, from, uh, from from renewables and electricity. So that's uh, yeah, that's that's quite, that's quite impressive. It's been a, a huge. Can huge we change. just uh, also maybe clarify to our viewers when we talk about electricity sector, like what is covered by that? Yeah. Now that uh, this is very uh, is, yeah, very common confusion when we talk about energy in general, we talk about everything that uses energy, from like cars to industry to houses. But when we talk when we talk about electricity mix, then we refer only about the electricity that you get in your plug. So where does it come from? From which sources does it come from? And there, renewables are more advanced than in other sectors, mm -hmm. like, you know, from heating or from transport, for example. We actually started receiving a lot of questions already. Uh, so maybe I start actually asking uh, some of them. So we have a question from Konstantinos, who is asking, uh, how did the COVID situation affect the targets? Because some things have changed in the last year. Or, um, maybe the targets have not changed, but the current uh, progress has changed. Um, well, uh, we still don't have uh, official statistics for 2020, but definitely there are indications that uh, the COVID uh, pandemic has affected the energy consumption and also the share of renewables. So on one side, there has been less demand for transport and also less uh, demand from industry due to lockdowns, less mobility from people, and also some industries uh, shutting down during certain times. And as well, there has been a huge or expected a large increase on the share of renewables. Because renewables are much cheaper to operate than fossil fuels. You don't need to burn anything, it just happens. Yeah. So then they have been prioritized during the low uh, consumption of, of electricity. Maybe actually we could take a very quick look at our latest briefing that we published. We actually published two briefings um, in December and January. And Mihai, the one that you worked on looks at renewable electricity. And maybe you could just mention some of the key messages from that, because that are kind of related to the bigger picture and the challenges. Yes, thank you very much. I think uh, a lot is actually um, happening in the renewable electricity sector, as Javier was mentioning, more than in the heating and in the transport sector. What we were trying to understand is uh, whether the environmental impacts have changed, have improved overall, by switching to more renewable energy sources and which were these categories. And we looked at six main categories like climate change or global warming potential, freshwater eutrophication, uh, air pollutant emissions, etc. And we found out that across most of these categories, we see improvements from having switched from fossil fuels to renewable electricity sources. Nevertheless, in two categories, we also find a potentially higher impact, and this is related to freshwater ecotoxicity and to land occupation. And specifically, what was causing this higher impact are the manufacturing processes for solar photovoltaics, solar photovoltaic modules, which are more energy and metal intensive. And for the, the land occupation category, it was uh, mainly biomass, biomass sourcing as well. You actually say that renewable, yes, we need it, but there are certain things that we have to bear in mind in terms of other impacts as well, which brings to some of the questions that our viewers are actually asking. Some of them are about uh, wind farms and uh, other forms of energy as well. So I'll just take them as we kind of go along. Uh, Sibu is saying, which agency monitors the impact of the installation of wind farms on biodiversity in the European Union? I know it's not exactly your area of expertise, uh, but there's a kind of related question from Yona as well. 
and she says Greece is being bombarded by applications of wind parks, uh, although the country has reached the EU targets, the EU goals. Can you explain to us in which way we can help climate change by destroying our mountains, forests, etc. The impact on nature as well. Um, maybe we could just take reflect that uh, on that very briefly. Yes, I think it is a valid question and. In fact, our analysis was showing that trade-offs need to be made in practice. Also in practice, there will be more trade-offs than what we could analyze in, in, in our reports and in our briefings. So obviously, when we talk about the expansion of offshore wind farms, on the one hand, we, need, we know that it is important to reach the climate objectives. We have very ambitious climate objectives for 2030 and 2050, and we want to become climate neutral. On the other hand, we also need that we also know that the European Green Deal is putting biodiversity at its core. So we need to make a better use uh, of these areas, whether it is for wind generation, whether it is for biodiversity protection, whether it is for fisheries. What we are recommending is further monitoring. We're recommending the development of best practices. And we're saying that where necessary additional legislation might come in hand to help with these processes. Thank you, Mihai. Um, we also have another question because we are receiving so many, so I'm going through them. Um, Benoit is asking, would nuclear energy, uh, especially thorium and molten salt, be considered renewable? Uh, well, it would not be considered renewable. That uh, is, uh, it's a mineral source in the end. It cannot be, it cannot be replenished. A different question would be whether it can take part on the, on the energy transition or whether it can, um, uh, it, can, it can help us in supporting uh, low, low carbon technology. Um, well, this is something that we have not looked at specifically, but uh, they will be, I'm sure it will be part of the debate on the, on the future of the energy system in the next few decades. Yeah. Javier, you were also leading the work on this other recent uh, briefing that I mentioned earlier, which looks at this transborder, you know, cross-border cooperation of renewables, because it is an issue to, you know, not every uh, renewable energy source might be the best option for all the countries, there might be challenges. Can you just maybe briefly mention the main findings of that briefing? Yeah, sure. Um, so we did this, uh, this project together with the European Topic Center, and there we looked at uh, specific examples of cooperation, transport cooperation in the deployment of renewable energy, so particularly for the four specific projects or for support scheme. And, um, and then we found that uh, that there are many challenges, that there are um, much less examples that we expect to find, and despite the support of the, of the European institutions, uh, and there's still the energy policy and energy projects are still very much nationally uh, focused. Uh, however, there are some very interesting examples. And, uh, we could see how uh, countries uh, face, face some, of, some of the difficulties into, into setting up the agreement, because it's rather complex, but then they also benefited from uh, from more security, from more, more efficient and cheaper energy uh, energy sources, and access to resources that they may not have in their own country. And as well, we look at what were the main enablers that I, that, that made it possible, such as a good communication strategy between the countries and with the population as well, and um, also allowing enough time and resources for the negotiations and keeping flexibility, both in the negotiation and with their own national legislation. Because if I can actually, from what I understand, is that it's not always that easy to store this renewable energy. So, you know, imagine a very sunny period. So you generate a lot of electricity from solar panels, et cetera, that feed into the grid. But if it is too much, then what? Is yeah, this the this kind is... of cooperation project that could maybe... Yeah, well, the, then it's more into, uh, uh, it goes more into the infrastructure, to the, into establishing transmission networks between countries to, to, to share this uh, exceedance, this excess of, of uh, electricity. But uh, also there, it goes into a much wider dimension to what, uh, how would we have flexibility to the network? Uh, it can be through uh, storage, for example, through batteries or even good old uh, pump storage. Yeah. Or, and, and many other ways to add flexibility so we can account for this variability, which I think is one of the main challenges of uh, renewable energy in the short to medium term. If and I maybe can chip we, in we here. Have, yes, please. Yes, I think that the demand side management should not be forgotten as well and measures that we have on the energy efficiency side, because 
the more we we improve the efficiency of generation and uh, efficiency at the end use points and end use sectors, the less we will require uh, on the generation side. Yeah, exactly. And Mihai, I wanted to also follow up with these, you know, the whole photovoltaic. Uh, what happens when a solar panel comes to the end of its life? You mentioned some of the impacts, but maybe you could just expand them a little bit more. Yes, we're actually doing work on this right now, and uh, we're not expecting to finalize it this year. Most likely it will be sometimes next year. But what we can see already is that on the one hand, uh, at the member state level, there are different approaches in the collection of solar photovoltaic panels. Uh, there are authorities dealing with these questions. Uh, there are also manufacturers who take back their, their panels. Uh, on the other hand, we also realized that with an increase in solar photovoltaic modules being sold to individuals, uh, there will be a growing need to find and to set up a very strong, innovative circular business model for the reclaim, for the recovery of the materials in the solar panels. Yeah, some of these metals that actually impact uh, nature at the end of their life cycle. We have another question. We have many other questions. Um, so I'll go through them. Uh, Charlie is saying, what role can be expected of Europe source based, Europe sourced biofuels as a replacement for fossil fuels in the transport sector with respect to its tendency to compete with food production, biodiversity and forests, et cetera? I can start with that. I think it is a very complex question. Um, it is true that biomass, bio-based energy sources are uh, difficult in some regards in that they're both uh, cutting across biodiversity, land use, the climate mitigation and the energy part. Uh, we've had our experiences with the first generation biofuels, which uh, were not always uh, the most efficient ones. There are in legislation, there are limits to how much first generation biofuels from uh, food crops, for example, you can use. But nevertheless, there is hope that there will be a second generation uh, technology development and that it, it will progress faster than it has today. In that case, we will have less of a problem with land use and with uh, impacts on biodiversity. I think there's also a bigger change in the whole mobility system being uh, transitioned into a more sustainable model as well. So it could, it will be actually one of our future uh, Facebook live debates, mobility sector and having a sustainable um, mobility model. So I'm going through the questions, but uh, Javier, you mentioned the infrastructure point and there's a question from Roland and he's asking, is the transition towards more renewables a challenge in the production plant or in the retrofitting of the actual transition grid? Oof, this is, uh, yeah, this is a good question. It's a bit technical, <laughs> but maybe yeah. if, you, if you take a very quick answer. I mean, I would say both. Uh, we definitely need to build on the infrastructure that is already in place, but uh, it has limitations. Yeah, the, the current infrastructure is based on a centralized um, energy system where you have like one big plant producing electricity and spreading it everywhere. Uh, this has to change. So we, we will need to build into this and retrofit it to the extent possible, I, mean, I think. But then we need to, to establish new infrastructure for a more decentralized uh, way of producing and consuming energy. Yeah, I think this is one of the, when it comes to implementation, achieving these goals, the responsibility of the national states, you know, national authorities, it's something that we see again and again. So I actually have a, a question uh, kind of related to that from Eastlu and, um, no, sorry, from Dimitris, I'll take that one first. How will the EEA ensure and enforce that expansion of renewable energy sources will take place without using up the little space left to buy diversity and wild nature. Of course, we do not have any kind of enforcement power. Uh, we do not uh, have that kind of mandate, uh, but maybe we could clarify our role uh, when it comes to, you know, supporting policy in these areas. Mihai, you were talking yes. a little... <laughs> Mihai, think, uh... you were talking a little bit about... Uh, Yes. These aspects. I think the first thing is to start monitoring areas where there are trade offs and where there are also benefits. Um, for example, there are some studies uh, looking at offshore wind parks and potential benefits there, benefits there while serving as uh, marine wildlife refuges. 
So uh, we can look at areas where there are benefits developing, but we, we can also look at where pressures are happening. At the same time, a lot of the pressures are happening at the national, local, or at the regional level. And there, the involvement of the member states and of competent authorities and of uh, all involved stakeholders is very important in order to make sure that the projects are designed in such a way that they do not really have a high impact, that the design of the project is changed or the type of technologies are being adapted to the local conditions. So the answer is very difficult because indeed the success of our climate mitigation policies and of our renewable policies lies in how we are going to implement them. What I can say is that we have this vision. The vision is very positive. We know that we need to develop as a, as a society in that direction, but a lot needs to happen now on the implementation side. Yeah, and I think the European Environment Agencies, it, it's important to kind of emphasize that it's a knowledge uh, agency. So unlike uh, national environmental protection agencies, we do not have that kind of um, uh, enforcement or, you know, some sort of a compliance regulatory role as such, but we do collect data from member countries, uh, which are actually more than the EU member states, and, uh, you know, share uh, this knowledge with our member states and uh, competent authorities. So in that sense, um, it does fall beyond our limits. It's up to the national authorities, and in some cases, the European Commission to make sure that the appropriate legislation is enforced. Um, so still going through uh, questions, uh, there is um, one question from Osolia. Uh, she's asking, what is considered to be the most significant bottleneck for the increase in the share of renewable energy? Is it technological, economical or something else? Who would like to take this one? Well, I can take, I can give one and then Mihai can give another one. <laughs> I think there are many limitations. Unfortunately, there are many challenges ahead. Uh, I think in the shorter term, uh, the integration of variable renewables is still a, a huge challenge. As I mentioned before, like sun lights whenever it's, uh, it lights and the, the wind blows whenever it blows. Uh, then we go into more like medium and uh, longer term, I think uh, related to the questions that already came before, land use is going to be an issue but for wind, for um, for solar and for, for, bio, for biofuels, it's already uh, an issue. And then, uh, so, so I think they're more on the on the technical side. And I think these are the two the two main ones. And then later on, as well, the harder to decarbonize sector. Some sectors are very difficult to to, to source with renewables. Mihai, would can, you like to add? Yes, I think that we can also think about the financial well about the other tools that we have at hand in order to promote renewable energy sources. Uh, the first one would be to maintain the carbon price signals, whether it is under the European Emission Trading Scheme and in non-trading sectors, uh, because a strong car carbon price signal will drive the decarbonization, whether it is in the power sector and or in the other sectors. A second uh, element uh, would be to strengthen energy efficiency standards or energy efficiency measures to allow renewables to become more prominent as a share in the energy sector. We also can think about aligning taxation. This is something that the Commission has put on the table to align the taxation in the member states with the climate mitigation uh, objectives so that we do not treat polluting fuels in different ways and in uh, uncoherent ways, I would say. But finally, there is also the question about how to direct financial flows actively into uh, technologies that make a difference into renewables and energy efficiency. And here the sustainable finance taxonomy is actually quite important and uh, hopefully will make a difference in the next years. Yeah, I think in any kind of transition will take some time, you know, in terms of, you know, having real impact as well. We have many, many questions. So I'm not sure if we'll be able to get to all the questions uh, within the time that is allocated to the discussion, but I'm going, I'm rushing through the, as many questions as possible. Uh, we have another question. Um, on sources of uh, energy, right? Uh, Frey is asking, what are the ambitions with regards to the hydrogen economy? So this was part of the European Green Deal. We'll take another one uh, uh, from Stefan, and uh, there's a debate on whether nuclear energy can be considered as a form of transitional energy within the EU. 
but it's consistently being criticized due, due to its potential environmental impact if, it's, if something goes wrong. Um, how do you see this thing? Maybe on hydrogen and nuclear in general, very briefly, not exactly our remit, but. Well, I think uh, uh, hydrogen is gonna play a, a huge role, particularly in the hard to decarbonize sectors, as I mentioned before. Uh, wherever we need a uh, sort of like very dense source of energy is definitely going to play a, a huge role in transition. Now, this is still a bit uh, um, on its infancy as technology, and I think this highlights the importance of innovation and development in the in rich the energy transition. When it comes to nuclear, this is a much more well-developed technology, and uh, we haven't looked at it uh, uh, in detail uh, as, as, as an agency, but I think definitely the the, the, what will be guiding the, the debate on nuclear will be whether it, uh, the, the price, uh, so the cost of, of electricity, especially now that renewables are getting cheaper and cheaper, how long they can uh, they can compete, and especially taking take into account as well that a nuclear plant is a huge capital investment that it gets locked there for a long time, and also the the discussion about land use too, uh, also in terms of the, their renewable the renewables take much more land than the nuclear. So I think these two. Uh, questions that still remain will guide a bit the debate on whether nuclear has, a, has an important role as a transition and, and a source of energy or not. I, I fully agree with that. And if I can come in here as well, I think that indeed this is a dilemma that some or several member states are facing at the same time. It is up to the member states in the end to decide how they want to uh, define their energy mix. Uh, but as Javier was saying, there are still some questions uh, and opinions, scientific opinions differ as regards the potential environmental consequences of nuclear waste. Uh, so the cost issue and the long-term handling of nuclear waste will be the two questions that in my view will define the future of this technology. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking at the questions. Um, there are uh, many on nature. Uh, impacts on biodiversity, etc., or different kind of projects. But we kind of touched that uh, point. Um, I'm looking at maybe a clarification question that I think it's something that you had mentioned, uh, Javier, from Baltas Anastasios. Why big hydroelectric installations aren't considered as renewable energy? Uh, big hydroelectric installations, you mean? Yeah. Oh yeah, they're, they're definitely they renewable. Are. I mean, they're the oldest uh, sort of renewable electricity. A different thing is that it is not considered, I mean, it has a very, very large impacts and it cannot be, uh, it can only be in a specific locations. And also the, lo the locations for large hydro in Europe have already been taken over, over the decades. So then usually it's not as much included in the debate. Uh, when we talk about newer renewables, uh, usually we talk more to other, other sort of technologies. But yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely renewable. It's just not as much part of the, of the current debate. Uh, there are a couple of other questions. On, there are many, many questions, if I can just uh, very briefly uh, go through them. Uh, Ereko is asking, again, can we rely, can we think of a you know carbon, low carbon mix without relying on nuclear? But I think we did kind of mention uh, the point there. Um, Somebody is asking, let me see, where they could get a little bit more information on our work. So maybe this is something that you could just uh, briefly mention what we do every year, the kind of data and analysis, and then yeah. my colleagues can share some of the links. Yes, if I may come in on this. So we have the annual trends and projections in Europe report where we track the progress of the European Union and of its member states towards climate, energy efficiency and renewable energy targets. We have the country uh, data viewers, country viewers, where you can see the development in, within each country towards their respective targets. We have then a package on renewable energy in Europe where uh, we have two uh, dashboards, two online dashboards uh, showing on the one hand national progress and how, we, how various technologies evolve uh, in heating, electricity, transport. Uh, we also have uh, dedicated publications like the one Javier was uh, mentioning about cross-border cooperation on renewable energy sources on our website or about trade-offs and benefits from switching to increase renewable energy sources. Yeah. 
yeah. and indicators as well. We have a, a exactly. wealth of indicators on many different environmental topics. Exactly. So I think there's a lot of uh, very valuable information sources on our website. Um, one of our Facebook followers actually mentioned, what are the biggest risks of uh, carbon locking? So maybe you just mention what carbon locking is and then uh, reflect on the risks. Who would like yes. to take this one? I'm happy to take it. That, that was yeah. indeed an assessment that we did a, a couple of years ago where we looked across the uh, electricity sector again and tried to understand or to calculate for each individual power plant the average age of the respective power plant. And what we saw at that moment was that there was a risk of investments in prolonging, in extending the lifetime of these power plants in order to, uh, to make them compliant with uh, emission legislation, whether it is for air pollutant or other uh, greenhouse gases as well. And that was constituting a certain lock-in because such an investment would prolong the life of a li of a installation by at least 20 years in order to recuperate initial investment. Now, I think that we have passed beyond that point and our current carbon price signals are quite strong. So we do not really see a risk of carbon lock-in. At the same time, some member states are uh, announcing publicly that they are planning to step out of coal generation, which will make a very significant impact on the greenhouse gas emission intensity of electricity generation. I will uh, take a few more questions, and this is going to be a last round. So for all the questions that we do not get the time to address, we will try to address them in writing in the comment section. Apologies for that. Uh, but this has been a very, very lively chat with a few more questions coming in to our um, experts. And I'm trying to select some different topicals, uh, topics that we have not discussed. So um, Aislinth is asking, what will be the most environmentally friendly way to heat our homes once we begin to phase out natural gas? So this is something that we all face very quickly. Yeah. I can say a few things and Javier, you can come in as well. I think there is not one size fits all approaches and we have to look at uh, where you individuals will also have to look at what are the local conditions depending on where this heating or respectively the cooling has to take place. If you are in a Northern country and if you have uh, good opportunities, you can use heat pumps. You can sometimes use local biomass if this doesn't really have an impact. Uh, but if you're in other locations in a southern country, you can consider solar thermal, you can consider solar uh, thermal and photovoltaic integrated uh, panels. So heat pumps as well. There are various technologies depending on, on uh, where you're located. Yeah, I totally agree. Okay, very good. Another very quick question. Uh, we did discuss this thing, but just to kind of clarify, Hannah is asking, are there any estimations of how large areas would be taken uh, into the renewable energy production to meet those deaths. I don't, I'm not aware of any estimations of this kind of thing, but maybe you are. Uh, there have been some recent estimations, but for certain particular countries, uh, not for the for the whole EU. Well, yeah, no, there have been as well, some estimations for the whole EU. And, and they, they vary greatly as well, because it depends on the efficiency that you're assuming for the, for the renewables and the technologies you're using. So I think uh, in the end, depends on getting the right mix of, of renewables. Yeah. Uh, another very quick thing, Remus on Facebook is uh, asking, how do you see the potential for offshore wind developments in the Black Sea? Yes. Have you looked into that? We have not looked into that, but the question is certainly relevant. What we have seen on offshore wind development is that they have taken off in countries with a shallower continental shelf where monopile uh, projects could be installed easier. At the same time, the, there are cost reductions and there are many developments right now in floating wind turbine uh, projects. So we hope that there will be significant cost reductions in floating wind turbine, uh, wind parks, wind turbine projects. And that will open the potential not only in the Black Sea, but also in other, in other seas and in other areas. It could also help to take a little bit, to distance a little bit the, the wind parks uh, from the shore, so take away the visual impact, and it could help integrate these projects better with fisheries and with the uh, marine conservation projects. 
Yeah. I mean, this is the point that we've been actually making uh, that whenever you reflect into renewable energy installation, you have to look at the wider aspect, the kind of impacts that it could have on the area, biodiversity, nature, and so on and so forth, as well as the full life cycle uh, reflection of the material that are used, including the kind of very precious metals that some of our viewers uh, were saying that these are very, very difficult to uh, procure. You know, to get hold of uh, in the kind of scale that we are looking at. Um, that is, Jurek, maybe, I am not fully aware of um, these um, uh, projects, I guess, or the, he talks about the Vaslav Smil attitude to energy vendor, uh, or the El Hierro project, but I'm not aware. I'm just checking if you know anything about these uh, I, I don't know particularly much about, uh, about the, this uh, specific projects, uh, yeah. of course, about the I, energy wind in general, but I don't know, maybe Mihai. Yes, I think uh, there have been articles criticizing either the pace or what has happened uh, with the energy wind and or whether the projects as such are feasible uh, at the scale envision, envisaged. I think Vaslav Smil is a, a prominent uh, researcher and uh, yeah, there have been some papers around this topic. What we're seeing so far is actually a rather fast progress at the level of uh, renewable electricity, but not really fast enough for where we want to be in 2050. And as we said ourselves, the interactions with biodiversity, the interactions with other environmental dimensions will have to be factored in. Um, let me say another element. I think we should not really talk about expanding renewable energy as such alone. We need to frame it into the concept of uh, living well within the planet's limits, within the limits of the planet. So we need to first and foremost have energy efficiency and resource efficiency, because uh, otherwise by 2030, we might end up using about three planets, only doing renewables. So we need to package it all as smart and as good as possible. Yeah, I think this is kind of corresponds to some of the points that our viewers were making on, you know, the kind of waste of materials and the impacts and so on, and the whole resource efficiency that has to be linked to uh, the kind of reflections. I think I will just give you the floor uh, for maybe just final remarks to both of you before wrapping this. Uh, we have seen amazing level of interest and uh, I could see that we could have planned a longer debate, but what I can actually promise to our viewers is that maybe we take up this subject uh, in different chats, maybe look at the mobility sector, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and reflect on that, uh, look at uh, closer alignments, what, to make, you know, what, what is needed to make it happen in terms of investment, or look at the full life cycle of these uh, um, like the photovoltaic uh, panels and so on and so forth, because it is uh, impossible to get uh, all the questions answered on the spot. So last reflections that you would like to add, maybe starting with you, Javier. Um, but just to, to be like summarizing what we're discussing about the, the huge progress that has been done on uh, renewables. And uh, as uh, well as Mihai mentioned, that needs to be coupled as well with energy efficiency, I think, so not only generate more, but actually needing less and in the wider frame of the of a circular economy. Yeah. Uh, and then also uh, highlight that we'll keep tuned because we have uh, interesting projects coming on the pipeline this year, but uh, prosumers, for example, or but also the types of energy assessment and, uh, and encourage people to, to check the, the, the website of the EA as well for more interesting energy projects. Mihai, please. Thank you. I think uh, you summed it up very well, Javier. Perhaps uh, just to say that the scientific articles and the, the scientific uh, agreement is that whether we look at 2030 or 2050, uh, the messages are the same. We need to be climate compatible. We need to be more energy and resource efficient and to be aware and preserving biodiversity. Um, and yeah, it's going to be a challenge it's, there is a lot to do on the implementation side. And from our side at the agency, we will try to help with uh, providing information and knowledge about how this process is happening, monitoring potential pressures and trends, 
and uh, hopefully uh, helping the debate and helping balancing actually the actual implementation of this transition. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank all our viewers. I hope we uh, did touch upon um, at least many of the questions that you raised and the topic that you raised. And we will try to answer uh, some of the outstanding issues, uh, questions in writing uh, in our chat. And uh, we look forward to future debates. So far, the next one is going to be on plastic and the environment in two weeks time. But I can definitely see that there is much more to talk about energy, renewable energy, and what Europe needs to do um, to achieve the objectives, the ambitious objectives. That. So having said that, thank you again. Thank you, Javier. Thank you, Mihai. Thank and you. Thank, you, uh, thank you. Big thanks to all our viewers for your questions.